Good afternoon. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Welcome to our show. Tori Stafford was a beautiful eight-year-old girl who was lured away from her school in 2009 and brutally raped and murdered. One of her killers, Terry Lynn McClintock, pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without a chance of parole for 25 years. But it was revealed a couple of months ago that she had been transferred from an Ontario federal prison to a Saskatchewan healing lodge. Today, we're putting those healing lodges in focus. We want you to join in our conversation. The phone lines are open now. You can call us toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. You can also tweet us at APTN in focus. Before I introduce you to our guests, let's go to the House of Commons, where this very matter has been the centre of much debate. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister knows that Tory Stafford's killer was behind razor wire and bars and is now in a condo. And he also knows that he does have the ability. Let me read to him what the Act actually says. It says, the Governor and Council may appoint a person to be known as the Commissioner of Corrections who under the direction of the minister has the control and management of the service and all matters connected with the service. Will he use the authority he has to put the killer back behind bars? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, I will let Canadians determine who is playing word games with talks of condos. The facts of the matter are clear, Mr. Speaker. In 2014, under those Conservatives, the offender in question was moved from maximum security to medium security, and that individual remains in medium security to this very day. Madam Speaker, Liberals always put criminals ahead of victims and law-abiding Canadians. Tory Stafford's killer was transferred from jail to a healing lodge on their watch. Today, her loved ones are gathering to call for action, demanding that child killers be kept behind bars, not in healing lodges without fences. But so far, the Liberals refuse to act. Canadians are outraged about it. What is taking so long, and when will the Liberals actually do the right thing and put Tory's killer back behind bars where she belongs? Madam Speaker, uh, all members of this House would share the deep angst of the families who have tragically lost children to crime. And that's why I, I, I asked for a thorough review by the Corrections uh, Commissioner to ensure long-standing policy in these matters has been followed and to reassess the appropriateness of, uh, of those policies to determine uh, that they are, in fact, the, uh, the right ones. Uh, the report was uh, made available uh, uh, late yesterday, Madam Speaker. I'm reviewing it at the moment. Uh, we all want this system to be as good as it can possibly be for the protection of the public. Joining us now, Matt Willen joins us in the studio. He's been working with the Ogajida Pimotisawin Kinematawin, or OPKS, it's a mouthful, as it's better known for the last two years. OPK aims to nurture and support marginalized and at-risk Indigenous young adults and their families. Matt grew up in the Corps and also works with young adults to keep them from making some of the same mistakes that he made. Although he doesn't work directly with healing lodges, he works in similar programs with clients and you travel to um, prisons and offer healing, traditional yes. healing services there. Okay, and also we have Marlene Orr. She joins us from Edmonton. Marlene is the director of the Stan Daniels Healing Lodge for male offenders. It's one of Correction uh, Canada's nine healing lodges. Residents at Stan Daniels are conditionally re released offenders. They're on day parole or full parole or statutory release with residency or inmates approaching their release date. The Healing Centre provides residents the opportunity to learn from and be mentored by and receive spiritual guidance from elders while at the centre. Okay, so most of our audience uh, is familiar with what we're talking about when we say traditional healing, but let's get into what that means in the context of a healing lodge. So first, let's talk about uh, the myths. They're, they're resort-like or they're somehow easy time. Uh, Marlene, I'll start with you uh, from Edmonton. You, you're there every day. Let's talk. Is, this, is it a resort? Is it easy time? No, it's not. As a matter of fact, uh, the residents that we have here have had to do a tremendous amount of work on addressing the issues that brought them into their criminal cycle to get here. They have to demonstrate a commitment to an Indigenous healing path, meaning they have to be willing to work with elders, to engage in ceremony, and to involve themselves in cultural programs here that address the root causes of their criminal behavior. While they're here, um, we have expectations of 
their involvement in programs, their involvement in ceremony, as well as um, uh, their behavior while they're here at the center. So, so it's not easy time. Um, they're accountable for their behavior. They're accountable for their healing. And um, we expect to see forward movement from them. How easy is it to get into these centers, though? You're talking about the things that they have to demonstrate while they're there. But do they have to be on a traditional healing path in prison before they could get into a healing lodge? Can you just explain the process? Uh, well, first of all, they have to be minimum security. Uh, we don't accept inmates that are medium or maximum security. So they have to have earned their way to minimum security level. Secondly, they have to have good behavior while they're in the institution. They can't be affiliated with any security threat groups. They can't have been um, breaking the rules while they've been in prison. Um, they have to demonstrate a commitment to working with us in addressing those root issues. And we very clearly lay out the expectations. They also have to be supported by their team in the institution, which includes their parole officer and other correctional staff. And they have to be approved to come here um, by the uh, regional uh, deputy commissioner uh, for the Prairie region. So it's quite a process to get here and there are uh, benchmarks of behavior that they have to meet to, it, to be able to come here. Okay, so these lodges, they're, you know, in a lot of ways, they're just in the public conscious right now because of them being in the news. Uh, but these healing lodges have been around since the 90s as an option for federal inmates. Um, how did that come to be? So they're not new, but they're not as old as, you know, the prison system. Um, when the uh, Corrections and Conditional Release Act um, came into enforcement, um, it opened up the opportunity for healing lodges for the Indigenous community to work with Indigenous federal offenders. So that's how um, lodges like ours came into existence. There are some that are run by Correctional Services Canada and some that are run by um, the Indigenous community like ours, which is a program of Native Counseling Services of Alberta. Okay, Matt, my next question is for you. you. You work with people who have been in prison. You've worked with people who have been through these healing lodges. What are the differences that you see in terms of outcomes from people who get out of prison versus who get out of these healing lodges? Well, the, the healing lodges, I feel uh, they help inmates to, see, uh, to reflect on themselves a little bit more. Um, just because because of the ceremony that happens there, but they have it also happens in prison. Mm -hmm. There's ceremony there as well, but uh, that's that's the one thing I think is like the, it's more lived. You're you're doing it more consistently. Right, so. it's part of your life, Marlene. I'll ask you. Um, I mean, you have, you've been doing this for a long time. What are some of the? There's presumably a lot of successes that you see with people who who re-enter society from these healing lodges. Could you share with us uh, sort of not just what the, how, how many people or what percentage of people would be uh, not recommitting crimes? Um, or I don't know how to <laughs> phrase it nicely, but um, it, when, you, when you go through a healing lodge, are you less likely to re-offend than if you come out of a prison? Well, first of all, you know, when, when people come to Stan Daniels Healing Center, we operate from some key Cree concepts in natural law. One of those is the concept of Otapame Swin, which is being the boss of yourself or self-determination. Mm -hmm. So when people come here, they have to have demonstrated already that they're, they're committed to working on themselves and their issues. While they're here, we hold them accountable for their own healing. The elders tell us that unless somebody makes up their mind that they want to change and are willing to demonstrate the hard work that it takes to change, there's nothing we can do to help them. And I liken that to people that you see um, go in and out of treatment centers. They go in because they're forced to, they come out and go back to their same lifestyle. Mm -hmm. They haven't reached that point where they've made that commitment. So when people come here, they've already made that commitment and we, we do hold them accountable. At the same time, we provide them with the tools 
through programs to address things like relationship issues, communication, um, how they think uh, with respect to authority figures. Um, we look at parenting issues. We look at violence that people have experienced um, and the impact that it's had on their lives. So we equip them with the tools to understand and address their behaviors, but we also provide them with a tremendous amount of support. Um, every staff person within this healing center um, is available to be an ear, to address behaviors, to provide support or direction, to provide supported referrals, and to develop uh, cultural supports in the Edmonton area so that when people transition to being out in the community, um, they have the supports, they have the tools. When we equip people properly and we, we um, hold them accountable for their behavior, they rise to that challenge. And that re results in fewer people returning to a criminal lifestyle. Do you see repeat customers? I guess customers isn't the right word, but do you see people that are, that are out, uh, they recommit offenses and then they're back at the healing lodge? Um, that happens very, very rarely. Um, for the most part, you know, the majority of people that go through our lodge, uh, the only time that we see them again is when we see them in the community or they come back to connect with us in ceremony to connect with the elder, to connect with the staff, or just to pop in to let us know how they're doing. Um, we very rarely see situations where people uh, reoffend. And what's the average length of stay for somebody who goes from a prison to a healing lodge? How long are they usually with you for? Um, it, it's very individualized. Uh, we have people that may come here for several months and then we have people who have been here for several years. It's all based on their sentence, where they are in their sentence, um, what their release plan looks like, what supports they have in the community, and what their interactions with the parole board have been. So I'll go to Matt. You, uh, in your work that you do in prisons, you would be working with a lot of people who, who are starting their spiritual healing, getting back to the roots of their traditions and who might go on to access one of these healing lodges. If that's what you, those are type, I yes. presumably you've seen some people who, yeah. who, who connect with their, the spirituality in prison and then eventually go on to this. Yes. What is the, what's the first step? Because presumably these people aren't totally connected to their culture, their traditions. There's been that, that connection's been lost. Yeah. What's the first step for you guys when you get in there and dealing with people like that? Uh, we, you know, we when we go in, we just try to show support to the to to the men, and uh, to get them to start thinking about uh, putting himself in other people's shoes, and uh, you know, and then ceremony. We always uh, see we always let people decide about the ceremony part, right? So. Uh, like uh, I could bring a guy and say, I could ask one of the guys, do you want to come to a sweat lodge ceremony with me? And, you know, if they say no, I don't, you know, but a lot of times uh, the, we do other ceremonies too, like pipe ceremonies or, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, usually guys who come to us usually are already involved in ceremony mm -hmm. through the prison system. So they've already started that reconnection process. Yeah. You, uh, I mean, you, this, you can speak to this firsthand, right? You were in prison. Was, did you have a connection to traditional healing at that time, or was that where you, where you got connected? Uh, yes. I was, as a young man, I, I, I was connected to it, but then the city and the, all the noise, it mm. led me astray. So, yeah, it's... Uh, when I went back, yes, I was reconnected. So when you... But I never went to any healing lodges or anything like no, that. No, you were just in prison. So when, you're, when you find yourself there, is there a natural inclination to make that reconnection to your culture and traditions? Or was it that somebody came into the prison and, and offered that, and that was the kind of hand up that you needed to get that reconnection process started? 
for me, it was just hearing the, the sound of a drum. There was a powwow going on. and uh, <laughs> Really? Yeah. So then it just it flooded back, you know. Yeah. The, but for me, it was the, that, that was in me as a young man, as a young child, actually. So for, like for somebody, like, there could be manipulation there. If you have no background with it, I, I don't know. Well, and that's something I'll ask you uh, when we come back. We need to take a break, but remind me, I want to talk to you about, is it all Indigenous people who, who go this route, or do you have non-Indigenous people too? We have to take a short break, but when we come back, we are going to explore the risks and the benefits of healing lodges, and we are going to be joined by Tori Stafford's dad, who has his concerns. Please stay with us. Join our conversation now. You can call in toll free at 1 877 647 2786. Like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus. And send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Today we are putting healing lodges in focus. We asked Facebook, do healing lodges help rehabilitate inmates? 70% of respondents agreed. 20% of respondents think they do not help rehabilitate uh, inmates. Right. We're going to go. Let's go to... Okay, so now we're going to go to social media to hear what some of you are saying about today's Healing Lodge topic. We've got Shaman. Of course they do. How else would you find your spirit but with those that teach about spiritual things and how to unblock the past wreckage to grow again? It's a good point. Vien says, along with their full custodial sentence and not time in a lodge equals credit to getting an early release or downgraded to a lesser secure facility. We've seen that. That's a lot of uh, some of the feedback that we've seen too is regarding if it's being used to somehow lighten your sentence. Uh, I mean, Marlene said that's not how it necessarily works. Lance, it depends on the individual. I guess that, yeah. Lisa Marie says Healing Lodge should be inside the prison or right next door, not for murderers uh, or others. Heal those before they become criminals. That's, that's a good point. And Claudia, healing lodges work depending on how ready a person is and how receptive a person is. Culture is an entitlement to each person, not to be judged. We all have different ethics and values. If you want to add your opinion to this topic, here's how you can do so. Join our conversation now. You can call in toll free at 1-877-647-2786. Like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus and send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. So we've been discussing Indigenous healing lodges. Uh, they've come under, this, under scrutiny in the past few weeks. Uh, Ogama Ochi, where child killer Terry Lynn McClintock was moved, is on the Nanakeet First Nation in Saskatchewan. Chief Alvin Francis, who didn't even know she was in his community until he saw it on the news with the rest of us, he had this to say. We give them that right to bring the institutionalized women to Niganit. And if I, if I were to tell you right now that was a wrong decision, I, I really wouldn't be able to live with myself because we allow Corrections Canada to come out to my First Nation. So I have to live with it, their rules. And their rules are that they tell me I shouldn't. I'm not there to make sure that they bring the right people in. They are, not Niganit. But at one time, our elders were involved in that process. But they cut that out a number of years ago. So maybe this could have been averted had our elders been involved in this. So many Canadians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, are outraged that a woman who murdered a young girl in Ontario has been transferred to a healing lodge in Saskatchewan. It's been described as everything from a health spa to a vacation resort. Uh, we've heard from our guests here who would beg to differ, but APTN's Todd Lamoran went looking for himself to find out if that's true. Here's his story. 
Cassandra Churcher feels the need to set straight a lot of misconceptions about the Okima Ochi Healing Lodge, especially that it is easy time in an unsecured setting is that it is a correctional service of Canada prison. It still has all of the harmful and invasive practices like strip searching, the practice of segregation. There's still medium security classifications, minimum security classi classifications, supervisions and protocols that you would find at every other women's prison in Canada. She's responding to last week when it was learned that Terry Lynn McClintock has been serving her time for several months at Okima Ochi. She's serving a life sentence in the murder of eight-year-old Tory Stafford. The Conservatives went after the government, often commenting about the Lodge. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Prime Minister knows he's playing games with words. Tory Stafford's killer was behind bars and behind razor wire. Now she's living in a condo. Freeland McClintock went from behind bars to a lodge where single and family residential units with bathrooms, a bedroom, a kitchenette and an eating area and a living room exist. That's where she's at right now, not behind bars. Comments on Michelle Rempel's Facebook page were mostly criticisms of Trudeau or about reinstating the death penalty, but a few questioned the living conditions. One said, the Healing Lodge description sounds more like a Best Western. A few others, their existence. Healing Lodges are ridiculous anyways. They should all be closed. Churcher finds these types of discussions harmful. We're entering this age of reconciliation within our indigenous communities and what we're seeing in the national media is a critique of the one site across Canada where indigenous women can receive culturally appropriate programming. McClintock once self-identified as a non-status Indian according to a 2012 Canadian press story. But Churcher would not comment on whether or not she belongs in Okima Ochi and says all women would benefit regardless of their crimes. Absolutely and again uh, Eventually, all people who are incarcerated will be reintegrated. That's the nature of the legislation in our country. So as a Canadian public, we would want to make sure that they have access to whatever programs they need. On Tuesday morning, Conservative MP Candace Bergen introduced a motion to debate McClintock's transfer. Again, the Conservative opposition questioned why McClintock was doing time in a healing lodge. So why is she being given a cushy transfer to a healing lodge with no fence. Karen McCrimmon, Parliamentary Secretary for Public Safety, spent much of her speech defending Okama Ochi's safety as a medium security prison. I urge my colleagues across the aisle to stop denigrating healing lodges. They are an important element of our correctional system and they have a record of successfully holding inmates accountable for the most serious of crimes. Conservative MPs plan to support and attend a rally planned on Parliament Hill on November 2nd. Todd Lamarand, APTN National News, Ottawa. So I want to go back to Marlene Orr in a minute because I want her, to, her take on the poll results that we have. 70% of people who responded say they feel that they, um, they serve a purpose and 30% say they don't. We're going to get back to that in a minute. Um, however, we, and I also want to get into non-Indigenous versus Indigenous people who access these lodges and uh, the issue of safety. But before we get back to all of that, we have a caller. We have uh, Matt's wife, Rachel, is watching this live at home. And uh, Rachel is in the same line of work as Matt, he explained to me during the break. But she's called in because she has some things that she wants to throw into this mix too. Rachel from Winnipeg is on our line now. Hello, Rachel. Rachel, are you there? I'm told she's there. We're just having some technical difficulties to connect her here. Oh, we lost her. Okay, well, so let's go. We have uh, Jessica from Kamloops, who's also called. Jessica, are you there? Hi, Jessica. Hi. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for joining our show today. What, uh, what comments did you have or questions? Well, I was just listening to all of the whole the whole thing, and and um, I was explaining to the the guy who took my call. I said I think that it is really beneficial to have the healing lodges, regardless of what your race or identity is, what your traditional background is, because I was explaining like for me, like I grew up in a violent um, like upbringing, like there was a lot of mental, mental, emotional, physical, um, spiritual abuse going on, right? So. Um, which resulted in me going out and using drugs and drinking and 
you know, getting caught up with the wrong people, being at the wrong place, the wrong time, you know, and so going to treatment over and over because people said I did. Then it just got to a point where, you know, like, what it really boiled down to, like, I'm in recovery now and I have just over two years uh, clean and sober. Congratulations. And what was really beneficial for that was um, finding um, a power greater than myself, so connecting to my spiritual um, whatever, like finding something that's greater than me. Your higher that power. I can, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, in, in recovery, which I attend AA, one of the things that says that my alcoholism was contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And I believe that, you know, I didn't have a drinking problem. I had a life problem, you know, and mm-hmm. so um, hurt people hurt people, right? I was fortunate that I didn't become a repeat offender, you know, being that all the things that happened to me. I mean, I was kidnapped, I was raped, I was abused. There were so many, you know, physical and emotional things that scarred me that made it almost impossible for me to walk through life, you know, without having shame to myself or having any value. And so, you know, when I, when I look at people, I have c- care and compassion for these people, whether whether they're doing wrong to others or not, because they didn't just decide one day, like, you know, I was telling my son the other day, I said, people don't just wake up and decide they want to be serial killers, you know? Yeah. Like, well, you hope not. Exactly. I mean, I'm sure there's, like, you know, mental stuff and whatever, like, more doctor stuff or whatever that goes on. But at the end of the day, you know, people, a lot of times when people develop tendencies or when they hurt other people, it's because something like that's been done to them. Yeah, you know, there's... I know that. For myself, like all the people like that abused me as a child were previously abused themselves, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, I have forgiveness for them. I have compassion for them and I pray for them, you know, and today I have a beautiful life, you know, and what gave me a beautiful life was the people that gave me the time of day and helped me to reconnect with myself, the core me, mm-hmm. learning who I authentically was, not believing the lies that I told myself or believing what people you know, told the things that people said who I was, that I just grew grew up believing that I was worthless, that I was never going to be good enough, that I was Mm -hmm. just like my mother. You know, like I lost my mom to a heroin overdose when I was 13 years old. And, you know, I've seen a lot of things. Like I was around that kind of atmosphere. So to grow up and have value and to believe that I was capable of doing anything, it took a lot, you know. Well, and and I'm happy that you found that through... Uh, you know, traditional indigenous healing, that that was, the, that was your path to reconnect with your spirit, your soul. And I thank you for sharing that with us, Jessica. That's, it's good to hear success stories. I'm sure Matt and Marlene have seen and heard lots of success stories in their time. We have Rachel back on the line. Rachel joins us from Winnipeg. She's watching her husband talk about uh, the people that he works with. Rachel is in the same line of work, and she had a few things to add. Rachel, are you there? I'm in trouble. Yes, I'm here. I'm in tr- this might be the first time that we've had somebody <laughs> uh, phone in to disagree with their domestic partner, but I like it. <laughs> Rachel, uh, yeah. what, what uh, are your comments and thoughts on this topic as we discuss it? I, I wrestled with my husband throughout the last two days with uh, the, our, our views. Um, I'm 13 years in recovery. I was raised in 53 different homes across across Manitoba, and I'm 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 you know I've been through the systems, the injustice system, and I was abused right to the core as a child. In my opinion, that considering Terry McClintock committed the highest crime in the Canadian Criminal Code of Canada, she should in fact spend her time in a 10 by 10 cell where she can still have access to an elder and heal from there. I believe that. It, to be given the honor to be on the beautiful sacred lands of us of indigenous people is in fact rewarding her. It is my belief that there are crimes that must be set in stone to do in a prison cell. I'm unaware if she is even on a child abuse registry, mm. as she has again been gifted, quote, to be around our little beautiful creations alongside other women healing. To me, this is absurd that our other women are once again put back to reliving trauma have known what she did to a child and have their own children within the lodge. I am completely about healing, forgiving, and all those good things and wellness in life, but we must ensure that crimes like this are for a prison cell and you can do your healing from that cell. And uh, I'm coming, being a mother of seven, 
and being in, stuck in every system possible in Winnipeg in my whole entire life, I feel that we have to, there's black and white set in stone that when you're sentenced to life in prison, mm -hmm. the highest sentence of any sort, it must be accountable because it's sending the wrong message to, to Canadians that it's acceptable. I want to hear from Matt. So this so was a discussion we, at your home last night. What's, yeah, what was we, your perspective on it? We both agreed that she shouldn't be allowed to, to go into a healing lodge. We both agreed on that. But mm -hmm. what, what we didn't agree on, because she, she thinks that uh, only Indigenous people should be allowed there. But I said, well, if they have a background that that uh, you know that they've done ceremony and things like that mm -hmm. beforehand, then I think they should be allowed as well. And uh, well, and we just heard from Jessica, who I don't think, from what I gathered, I don't think that Jessica is indigenous, and she was saying that she found uh, the traditional healing to be beneficial to her, and it helped yeah. her connect with connect with her spiritual self. Matt, you and I were discussing right before we came in there that you know, can you reconnect with traditional spirituality if that's not your history you that, had had some comments about should people have to prove that they are indigenous or is it okay if they're not i want to hear your opinion of that and i want to hear rachel's opinion of that because that's this is the kind of the basis of a lot of what's being discussed out there it's not necessarily our healing lodge is good or bad but who should get into them so and rachel you've raised a good point too yeah. should certain people be uh, there's no way, your, your sentence is set See, in stone and there's no me, way you can get into the it. The thing about the, this case is it's the crime, right? There's other, I know there's also children living in that uh, healing lodge, you know, with uh, their mothers and stuff. So, mm. and this woman, she took a, uh, you know, one of the most innocent among us yeah. and stole her innocence and then stole her life. Yeah. In my opinion, I, 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 I just don't see how anybody can justify a healing lodge in that in that case. Other people, yes, I'm all for forgiveness. I'm all about empathy. I, I believe people change, but I mean there are some crimes that you commit that you can't come back from. Well, and I want to go to Marlene then. Marlene, you work at Stan Daniels. You said that there's the people that come to Stan Daniels um, are minimum security inmates, but that doesn't mean that they weren't high security inmates at one point and then had worked their way up to medium and then to, to minimum. You could be, I'm assuming you've seen people who have committed some pretty heinous crimes in your time uh, dealing with the people who come and go from Stan Daniels. Marlene, do you think that certain people should be exempt, depending on what their crime is, should be exempt from getting into a healing lodge? I think it's really individualized. Um, we know that um, uh, almost to a man in our healing lodge, there have been addictions issues. Addictions are all about managing pain and emotional pain, deep mental pain, um, spiritual pain. And so um, when we look at that, um, really the opposite of addictions, Dr. Gabor Mate says, is connection. And so um, it's really individualized. People have to earn their way here. That's the bottom line. Regardless of the crime that they've committed, they have to earn their way here. Sometimes that's a long process. We have people here that it's been, you know, 25 years of earning their way to get here. Um, that's a long time. Uh, but they've demonstrated not over, you know, a short period of time, not in one way, but in numerous ways that they've earned their way here. Um, and so at some point, these people are going to be released to the community. Mm -hmm. Do we want them to be released, um, having addressed the issues that brought them into this criminal life? Or do we want them released with institutional thinking, institutional mentality, and institutional behaviors, mm -hmm. um, and still posing a threat to the public? People who come here, their risk is manageable, and they don't pose a risk to the public. Um, if that were the case, they wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So I think it's highly individualized, and we need to take into consideration, you know, the hard work that people have done to get to a healing lodge. Um, do you think that, I mean, there's, 
and I don't, I don't question that a lot of people have worked very hard uh, when they're in prison to get to the point where they could be transferred to a healing lodge. But and maybe it's just because I've been in this line of work for two plus decades that I'm a little bit cynical sometimes and that I wonder, you know, are there, could you fake it? There are psychopaths, sociopaths out there. And, and could you be in prison and look and go, I can see exactly how I need to play this system in order to get myself out of the situation that I'm in now, being prison, and get myself into something that I, I believe would be an easier ride? It, I mean, I don't, I don't know that the system can ever guarantee that there aren't people who can work that system like that. And is there, have you seen it? Well, you know, I, I think that every system, you know, when that involves human beings is never 100% um, fail-proof. Having said that, um, when people arrive here, like I said, they've earned their way, but we hold them accountable. We develop relationships with them. We get to know them. And when we see that people are starting to step off of their path, we intervene immediately. And we have a whole team that intervenes um, with that individual to get them back on track. And so, um, sure, you know, there's always going to be people that find ways to manipulate any system. Yeah. However, there are checks and balances along the way that minimize that. And once at a healing lodge, you know, it's uh, um, here in our center, we... Uh, are really involved in the day-to-day -day lives of people. So we can notice just slight changes of behavior and address it before it becomes a bigger issue. And you know, healing lodges are important. They're important as part of a gradual structured release into the community. Without them, we turn people out who have been incarcerated for years, mm -hmm. who have learned institutional behavior, don't trust authority, or, or had that behavior reinforced, who have learned to manipulate, for sure, who have learned survival skills that are required in penitentiaries. Mm -hmm. And those skills, um, they don't work in the life of uh, someone who you know, is a law-abiding citizen. Mm -hmm. So we, we can either choose to address that in a slow, structured way, or we can turn people out of the system to have them with the same behaviors, the same mentality, and, you know, reoffend and go back into the system. Yeah. The second way costs more money and is, is riskier to the public. You know, a slow, careful approach yeah. with supports in place, with interventions when they're required, that reduces the risk to the public and saves the public money. That's a good point. Okay, we have to take another break, but when we come back, we have Tory Stafford's dad, he weighs in on the issue of healing lodges, and we're going to discuss Tory's law, which he hopes will end certain criminals from accessing those healing lodges. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back. For those of you just joining us, we are putting healing lodges in focus. Last week, over 100 people rallied on Par Parliament Hill. They are angry about the transfer of child killer Terry Lynn McClintock to an Indigenous healing lodge. They all wore purple, They're f the favorite color of Tori Stafford, who was eight when she was kidnapped and murdered by McClintock and her boyfriend in 2009. Protesters want the federal government to remove McClintock from the o Okama Ochi Healing Lodge and put her back behind bars. They called it justice for Tori. Our justice minister, there's nothing stopping every one of us from calling him up and saying that we don't support murderers going to healing lodges. It's wrong and it's shameful. The laws need to change to keep these monsters behind bars and have them serve the full sentence that has been given to them. They need to serve out their time, and that is one of the reasons why we are here today, to change the laws. Life means life and no healing lodge. We're joined now by Tory Stafford's dad, Rodney. Rodney, thanks for joining us. No problem. Good afternoon. 
So you were advised uh, in the summertime that uh, Ms. McClintock had been removed from a prison and transferred to a healing lodge in Saskatchewan. She'd been, she's so far served eight of her 25-year sentence, and these lodges, my understanding, are for people who are on the brink of release. I'll go back to Marlene at some point and check with her, but I thought it was for people who are year, a couple of years away from being uh, released. So she should have seven years left on her sentence before she would even be eligible for a faint, uh, for a release under the faint hope clause. You must have several questions going. This, this woman was sentenced to 25 years, and after eight, she's in a healing lodge. The math oh, is yeah. suspicious, right? Oh, very, very. So what's, what do you make of this? I think it's wrong, uh, completely wrong. There is no reason whatsoever for Terry Lynn being the heinous murderer that she is to be within one of these facilities. How do you think she got there? Loopholes in the system. Well, we'd, we've been, I'm not sure if you joined, if you were listening to the pro program prior to joining us, but we'd heard from Marlene Orr. She works at Stan Daniels Healing Lodge in Edmonton. It's a, a healing lodge for male offenders. She was we're, we're, uh, walking us through that there's a lot of steps that you have to go through in prison. Our guest Matt here was saying the same thing. He goes to prisons and works with men who are uh, needing to reconnect with their culture. They're saying that there's a lot of steps that you have to take long before you would ever go from a prison to a healing lodge and in one of these one of the things is in, that it involves as well is that you need to be on good behavior in prison you have to be a kind of a model, a model inmate so yeah. when you hear yeah. these things what's your response because you i'll remind our viewers because they probably don't know this um you get updates as to what's happening in ms mcclintock's life this is something that corrections canada uh keeps you up to date on as the uh family of her victim right so when you hear yeah. Uh, that you know you need to have model behavior, et cetera, to, in order to get into these. What's your response based on what you know of her time in prison? Well, I know for a fact, uh, judging by the documents I've received from Corrections Canada, there's no way whatsoever that Terry Lynn should be anywhere near one of these facilities. Um, she has continuously um, had offenses against her. While um, in prison. While, while being incarcerated. Uh, <laughs> and this is nowhere near what you would consider a model inmate. So I know we there was a Canadian press story in 2012, I think 2012 or 2013, uh, that outlined in great detail that she had lured a peer support worker into um, a, a meeting with the uh, sole purpose of, or her sole intent was to attack this woman. She beat her mercilessly. She pled guilty in court. Uh, a judge said she, he found she had no remorse whatsoever. She had six yep. months tacked on to her sentence, but it runs concurrent if you're already in jail for, for, the, for this. Um, yep. And now she's, she's somehow into this, this healing lodge in Saskatchewan. You'd said when we talked earlier, uh, we chatted yesterday, Roddy, you'd said that your problem isn't with the healing lodges. It's with, no, not. It's with certain people accessing them. Can you explain that? Um, I myself, like, I, after reviewing everything to do with these healing lodges, I do believe it is, it, it is a good situation for some people who warrant going back out onto the streets. Like, uh, an example I gave yesterday, um, an accident where somebody accidentally claims a life, but there was no intent behind it these people are going to feel remorse. They're going to feel hurt on the inside as well. They're going to want to change their lives to get back to society. And these programs would help that out. But when it comes to the heinous acts behind a, like a, a monstrous killer it, of a child at that, like how, how does it, how does somebody even remotely of this magnitude get into one of these facilities? Well, and there's, um, there's the issue too of uh, whether you're indigenous or non-indigenous in order to access these healing lodges. There's been speculation, uh, uh, Terry Lynn had said that at some point in the court process that she is indigenous. Uh, her brother recently told Global News that she and uh, they are as indigenous as he is green and from Mars. That's his direct quote. What, do you, what are your thoughts of her uh, being non-indigenous? according to her brother, um, and in the healing lodge. If, if she followed what she had to do in order to get into the healing lodge, um, it's to my understanding you don't even have to be Native or Indigenous. You just have to identify with the Indigenous culture 
and want to make your changes according to Aboriginal culture. Um, <clears throat> she, yeah, she shouldn't be anywhere near one of these places. Okay, so right before this show started, um, Ralph Good, Minister Ralph Goodell, he had ordered a review of how Ms. McClintock got into a healing lodge. Um, he uh, has responded, he's got his report back from Corrections Canada, and he had this to say. Today we are taking steps to improve uh, the policy. Uh, first of all, by elevating the level of decision making uh, in these cases uh, to the level of the Deputy Commissioner for Women. Uh, heretofore, the decisions have been made uh, at, at regional levels, uh, and uh, going forward, uh, the, uh, the Deputy Commissioner for Women will be involved in the decision making to make sure national standards are being applied, there's national consistency, that all the appropriate factors are. So, Rodney, that's, that's the Minister Goodell saying, uh, I mean, it's hard to cut through when politicians speak what they're actually saying, but it sounds to me like he's saying we're going to look at uh, the, the uh, guidelines around how people get into healing lodges, but it doesn't look like there's any mention of that affecting McClintock being in one. What are, I'm going to leave the final thoughts on that matter to, on that issue to you if you want to comment on what Mr. Minister Goodell well, had I to say. Now, I've, I've just recently read an article where um, Ralph Goodall has stated that um, the legislation that is being applied right now will, um, will and does affect uh, past and present cases. So <clears throat> upon questioning towards him, he was asked if one of the questions asked to him was if this could um, reflect on Terry Lynn's case, and he did say yes. Oh, no. Hello? Oh, there he is. We thought we lost you for a minute, Rodney. Sorry, carry oh, on. Oh, no, no, sir. That's okay. So I'll oh, ask... Sorry. I'll ask Matt here. I want to get back to, uh, you know, the, how people get into these into the healing lodges in the first place and the uh, guidelines that are laid out. Do you yeah. think that non-Indigenous, I'm asking Matt here right now, uh, who works with people who are uh, in prisons and when they get out of prisons oftentimes too, um, but do you think that people who are non-Indigenous should have this option as a tract? Well, well, is that for me? When we're doing oh, a, a sweat lodge ceremony or a sun dance, we don't say you can't come or somebody can't come based on that and I don't think that that should be the criteria mm -hmm. I think it should be like I said the crime that you committed that should be the criteria and uh, people will manipulate the system in any way that they can You've like you said there's, I've seen it yeah, yeah. It, uh, it happens all the time people go to a treatment center or get bailed to a treatment center just so that they can't serve you know what I mean so that they don't have to serve as hard of a sentence or you know what I mean and it's the it same. It is a nicer facility. I mean you've been in these facilities. It's nicer than a than a cell. Than a jail cell, yeah. yeah. It's well obviously yeah it's a way nicer because you get a bit more freedom and you know you're also uh, learning nice things right mm -hmm. so. I'm gonna go back to Rodney and give you the last word on this. Tell us about Tory's law. What's that? Um, it's it's the law. I, I, we're hoping to push towards the government and making um, it harder for um, monsters who prey upon people of the vulnerable sector, um, people who are elderly, um, children, disabled, um, handicapped, anything like that. And, and we're, we're, we're aiming at trying to make it so that there is no possibility for lowered securities, there's no possibility for day passes, there should be no, no leniences towards these people. Once somebody who commits a heinous crime of this nature should lose all right like there's there's no reason for any of this to be happening right now and i noticed that there's a, you guys have a petition that started last time i checked to see there was up to 5000 signatures people who agree exactly with you that there should be some people whose crimes are just so heinous that you don't have any option other than to serve your time cold in a cold hard cell 
We have, of course, run out of time, as happens at the end of the hour. That's all we have for today. But this episode will be available for download as a podcast on our website at aptinews.ca backslash podcast. Uh, and if you missed any of this uh, show and you want to catch up, you can check out the website aptnnews.ca. I'm Melissa Ridgen, and I'll see you back here on In Focus next week. I thank all of my guests for joining us. I wish we had another hour because we were just getting into it. We've got lots more to discuss. Thank you all for tuning in. So I want. To